everybody, all our uh, panelists, trustees, administrators, uh, department heads, and welcome guests. It is six o'clock on Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. I'm going to call this meeting of the Miami Township Montgomery County Board of Trustees to order. If everyone could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Morris? Here. Mr. Cole? Here. Mr. Posey? Here. We begin each meeting with the reading of casualties. I'm pleased to inform everyone that there are no military casualties to report. Uh, Chief Stegelmeyer, you have first responder casualties. Good evening, board. The following is the first responder casualty list for the period of August 5th through August the 18th of 2020. Corrections Officer Daniel G. Oaks, Yakama County Department of Corrections, Washington. End of watch August 1st, 2020. Sergeant Stephen Splann, Bloomfield Hills Department of Public Safety, Michigan. End of watch August 2nd, 2020. Lieutenant Chris Cunningham, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, Florida. End of watch August 5th. 2020. Fire Equipment Operator Eric Aishi, Hawaii Fire Department, end of watch August 8, 2020. Police Officer Sheena Day Yarborough Powell, Beaumont Police Department, Texas, end of watch August 9, 2020. Fire Engineer Peter Hine, Big Pine Volunteer Fire Department, California, end of watch August 11, 2020. Canine Roscoe, Anderson County Sheriff's Office, South Carolina. End of watch, August 12, 2020. In K-9 Ranja, Tacoma uh, Police Department, Washington. End of watch, August 13, 2020. If everyone would please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I'd like to uh, welcome all of our guests. Uh, just a few early uh, housekeeping notes for those of you who may not have visited a Board of Trustees meeting before. We welcome you. I wish we could be meeting in person so I can meet you all personally, but thank you for coming to this virtual meeting. Uh, if you're here to speak specifically on one of the two zoning cases we will be hearing um, this evening, the time to make public comments would be during the zoning case. So there will be two opportunities for residents to speak. One is the open public comment period. One is during the zoning case itself. So if you want to be on the record specifically regarding the zoning case, then I would encourage you to not come forward during the public comment period, but to come forward during the zoning case. In, in both cases, uh, Mr. Hinkleman will be monitoring people who raise their hands. Uh, so what will happen is I will open the floor for public comments. You raise your hand. Mr. Hankelman will bring you in front of the Board of Trustees. The comment period, both for public comments and during the, the uh, zoning meetings, are strictly for comments. It is not a question and answer period per se. Uh, so please feel free to bring your comments. Uh, if they include questions, they may or may not be specifically addressed or responded to, but we do appreciate everybody bringing forward your thoughts and ideas. With that, I'll begin the meeting by making a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Mr. Morris? Aye. Mr. Culp? Aye. Mr. Posey? Aye. Mr. Hinkleman, you have new business regarding a motion to confirm specifications on a new trash contract. I do. Good evening, board. Uh, as you are aware, uh, the last meeting that we had, uh, we did discuss in work session um, our current uh, contract for trash. Um, so I just wanted to uh, share my screen here shortly. Uh, just to go through a couple items to talk about with this trash um, agreement. And not to be trite, but can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. 
Um, so the uh, just wanted to go through a couple highlights uh, just to talk through. Obviously, if you have any questions or concerns as we go through this, please stop me. Um, as you are all aware, our existing contract provider is Rumkey. Uh, our contract is coming up for consideration. That contract ends on December 31st, 2020. Uh, it is the end of a three-year agreement that we previously had. As part of that agreement, we do have two option years available to us. Those two option years for 2021 and 2022 um, are at predefined rates, which you see before you. Uh, and there is a, an estimated 4% raise for each year uh, if we were to consider those uh, options. If we were to take those options, just to make it clear, those options are based on the existing bid specifications uh, of which um, all of the existing requirements that are out there would stay. Um, Option two, which is what is being presented this evening, uh, and as you all are aware, uh, involves going back out for bid uh, to see what rates and what options are available to our community um, with different bid specifications than what we currently have. Um, with that said, uh, I just wanted to note a couple of the considerations as we uh, discussed last week, uh, or excuse me, two weeks ago in our work session. Um, Generally, we have logged all the complaints we've received from residents about trash. Um, you know, a lot of those concerns are uh, addressed by our provider. So, you know, those deal with customer service, missed service, specific quality of service complaints. Um, but there are some of those agreements uh, or, or concerns that we discussed uh, are not able to be addressed by uh, the service provider because the contract states um, that they are required or that is what they bid on um, with the contract to do something specific. So some of those things are like pickup times, multiple day service, um, senior rates, multiple sizes of containers, uh, et cetera. So uh, as you see before you within the packet, there is a draft set of bid specifications. Um, those bid specifications modify our existing specifications, so they would not be the same. Um, they do keep the majority of the existing standards, uh, like unlimited trash collection, um, large item pickup, hand service, collection of trash at township buildings, um, those kind of things that are generally in the agreement are still going to be in the agreement. Um, what the bid specifications added or changed, uh, there's a number of small items, but um, one of the bigger things is that it clearly states our preference for weekly recycling. Um, it moves the contract to three and a half years instead of three years, um, as well as it makes a, an entire section, a very clear section um, that uh, requires penalties on a provider if they do not remove the trash uh, toters from our community if we were to change providers. As we are all aware, the last uh, time we went through this process, unfortunately, uh, we changed providers uh, and we had a number of issues uh, related to the existing toters staying in our community. Um, I just want to note that these bid specifications have been reviewed by our legal counsel uh, and um, are coming forward to you as draft uh, documents. If you do feel this evening that the, the bid specifications are acceptable, uh, this is the proposed timeline, uh, which would take the bid specifications and put them out tomorrow um, with a September 4th uh, pre-bid meeting. So we would anticipate meeting with the potential uh, haulers or collectors for our community, uh, as well as have all of their questions, comments, and um, interpretations uh, provided in writing by the end of that day, uh, and then we would give them until September 23rd uh, to provide a bid in which we'd have a bid opening on the 23rd, uh, which then uh, potentially October 6th at the Board of Trustees meeting, a resolution could be passed to adopt uh, those bids if we, uh, the board felt that they were um, acceptable. And again, that would, would have January 1st, 2021 uh, as the new contract start date. With that said, um, again, those bid specifications are before you. I know we've been through this a number of times, uh, discussing different points. I certainly can touch on any um, specific item you'd like to, um, but generally, I just wanted to 
discuss where we were at and move forward uh, with a motion if you are uh, interested in going out for bid. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Henkelman? All right, hearing none, I will open up the public comment period if you wish to make a public comment on any topic. Um, but specifically, if you want to talk about the zoning case, I'd, I'd recommend you wait until those public hearings are open in a matter of moments. Anyone making a public comment, raise your hand at this time, and Mr. Hinkleman will invite you into the room. I have Kathleen Bradley. And for the record, please, as I, oh, maybe not. Kathleen took down her hand. Never mind. Uh, I don't believe we have anyone at this point in time that would like to speak. Excellent. All right. I will therefore close the public comment period and make a motion that we uh, approve and the bid specifications and push out a request for bid on the trash contract for a period of 2021 through June of 2023. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? I would just want to more. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Everyone understands that in going out for bid, we are not nullifying our current agreement. We will still have a, an option to pursue and maintain the current agreement at the option pricing. We're just uh, going out to the market and see if there is a better deal to be had. Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Colt. Aye. Mr. Posey. Aye. All right, I'm going to uh, make an assumption that the majority of our guests who are here for the zoning uh, cases are here for zoning uh, case number 57. Uh, so I think I'd like to propose that we do zoning case number 58 first uh, and get it out of the way. So I will make a motion to open the public hearing for zoning case 58-2020. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Any discussion? I'd just like to make a note, Mr. Morris, that the zoning case is actually ZC 445-20. Uh, the resolution number is 58. Thank you, sir. So I, my motion is then to open case uh, ZC 445-20 and seconded by Mr. Cole. Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Posey. Aye. Zoning case number 445-20 is now open. The following will be the order in which this hearing will proceed. Staff will give a report. Then the applicant will have an opportunity to speak. Any proponents and or opponents will have an opportunity to speak. The board will review and vote on the findings of fact for the case. The board will then close the public hearing and make a motion on the resolution concerning this case. The board will now hear a report from the staff, Mr. Hinkleman. Have the legal requirements for this hearing been met? And do you have a recommendation from the Miami Township Zoning Commission? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, they have. And I do have a recommendation, which I will read into the record at the end of my report. Uh, I am again going to share my screen. Uh, and uh, I apologize for saying it, but I do have to ask every time just to make sure we're all on the same page. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Uh, so again, the zoning case that is before you is ZC 445-20, a uh, rezoning from A to SPPUD, uh, otherwise known as the Medler Plan Development. The location we are discussing this evening uh, is located just to the north of Medler Road, uh, to the east of Miamisburg Springboro. Uh, it is also just north of the elementary school. Uh, the specific piece of land, uh, as you can see here, is right across from the entrance uh, to Medler View Elementary. Uh, it is just to the south of the development that was annexed into the city of Miamisburg, uh, a housing development called Aberdeen. Um, the location that you see here, uh, again, the access uh, to this site, this site itself is being proposed as access to that residential subdivision. Uh, so as we move forward here, you'll see the lots that are being created are intended to create uh, an access for that development, um, as well as create an individual, a single lot for home construction. 
So Kyle, yeah, as I understand, yeah. Kyle, as I understand what I've read, those two houses on those two existing lots have been acquired already. Correct. As you can see, uh, if you can see in this photo, uh, there are no longer any homes on the lot. Uh, the um, applicant has purchased the lot and has, has cleared it uh, with the intention to, again, um, put the road that will connect as a secondary access to their development uh, into uh, their development from this location. So again, uh, the house that you see on the left uh, is uh, the blue house, uh, and then um, on the left, you'll see there's a tree cover, uh, and then on the right, you'll see there's also a, a fairly heavy tree cover uh, on either side of this development. This again shows you that location. Uh, these photos were taken standing on the school property. This photo uh, shows you the um, access point to Aberdeen. As you can see uh, within the development, uh, this would be a secondary access off of Medler. Um, but again, uh, with only two access points, it's very likely that both of these will be utilized. Um, the uh, overall Aberdeen development has over 130 lots, uh, but what is being proposed this evening uh, within the community, within our township, is just one lot. This is the site plan that the applicant has provided. Uh, as you can see, you can see there are what are proposed to be four lots. Those four lots, uh, are uh, one lot, lot one, which is buildable, lot two and lot three, which would be uh, managed by the homeowners association and would not be buildable. And then lot four would be the right of way, uh, which will have to be dedicated as a public right of way. This is an aerial just showing you those four lots. You can also see the, uh, the home that used to be on the property. Uh, and then behind that home, uh, there used to be a large barn structure that was on uh, the other uh, farm property and all of those structures have been removed as of this time. I just wanted to note a couple other items. Um, as part of this rezoning, the applicant is asking for a site plan, uh, which you noted or you saw before, which was those four lots, uh, but they are also asking for the creation of development standards. Uh, those development standards cover a number of topics. Uh, one of which is signage. So as this is the entrance to the development, they are asking for one entrance sign on the north side, which would be on lot two, uh, that would allow them to advertise uh, Aberdeen, the subdivision, uh, which again, we have uh, given them specific standards that would meet our general requirements throughout the community. Another topic uh, that is of uh, importance to the neighbors in this area uh, is the screening uh, on the east and west of the property. Um, you can see that there, again, is existing tree coverage that are in that location, uh, but within the development standards, there was a requirement to protect uh, a buffer zone, uh, as well as to add additional trees uh, on a landscape plan. You can see within your packets, there is a landscape plan that has been provided that does meet the requirements of Article 45A to provide that buffer requirement. Again, lot one, the applicant is proposing to have a home on. This location uh, would be a single home, uh, but since the applicant doesn't know what home they are planning to build, uh, they are asking for the ability to have six home uh, styles permitted. So you will see within the packet that they are providing those six home styles, uh, which vary in terms of windows, garage, doors, the, the layout. Um, what you won't see within our standards are the same um, requirements that we may have in other uh, residential subdivisions uh, in terms of a percentage of brick or stone. Um, but what these standards do um, require is that no vinyl siding is permitted uh, on this location. Uh, that is due to the fact uh, that uh, almost nowhere else in the community have we permitted in a residential district uh, vinyl siding as a primary material uh, in many years. Um, and I also noted the uh, lot one setback requirements, but there is a substantial lot one setback requirement um, from the rear property where it is adjacent to other residential. Some other general standards uh, that are within those development standards, uh, they deal with stormwater, uh, the public right of way that would have to be dedicated, as well as the expected maintenance of those homeowners association properties, 
uh, and that public road right of way. Uh, you will see within the Zoning Commission recommendation, uh, which I will state in a moment, uh, that the Zoning Commission is recommending uh, that the roadway maintenance agreement uh, be put in place between the City of Miamisburg and Miami Township. Uh, so the City of Miamisburg would maintain this roadway uh, to uh, accommodate the residential subdivision within their community. Uh, uh, other uh, item, I'm sorry? Uh, when we put requirements on the developer, such as maintaining this buffer zone, in this particular case, there's already a, a large number of mature trees, which we can dictate stay. You say that we will set forth additional trees to be planted. How does that how is that enforced? Yeah, what, what, what happens over the next couple of years if they plant a couple of trees and they all die? Uh, do we have recourse to come back and ask them to be replanted? Sure. So the way that our code reads under Article 45A, um, the trees that are planted are planted per a landscape plan. So that plan exists and is approved. If a tree that is on that plan disappears, let's say because someone cuts it down, um, they are required to replace that tree at the caliper it was when it disappeared. So um, if it were to die of natural causes, unfortunately that would mean that you would have to replace it. So as they get older and older, it costs someone more to replace it. So if it dies in the first year and the, the nursery warranties the replacement of it, it's very likely you're replacing it one for one because it's a two inch caliper tree you would replace a two inch caliper tree. But if that tree existed for, for 10 years and it becomes 10 calipers, then there's a, a, a code that um, incentivizes people to try to keep those trees alive. Otherwise they would have to plant additional trees to make up for the, the more elderly tree uh, that has, has been removed. And each of these plans uh, submitted have a, have a full lot site plan of what's existing and what would be new. Correct, the landscape plan that is provided would be the, the document that would be required to be kept. If trees that are on the existing um, property line were, were to die, um, those trees would not be part of that landscape plan um, and would not be required to be replaced, uh, but the developer could not remove those trees prior to their aged death. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a timeline, um, the Zoning Commission, and I did not change that, but the Zoning Commission, uh, they voted last week. Uh, the Board of Trustees votes tonight. Um, because this is a rezoning, it is a 30-day referendum period. Uh, so within 30 days of the vote this evening, um, if somebody wanted to take that to um, referendum, they would have the right to do so. Um, at the end of that 30 days, all of this would go into place, and due to the approval that is occurring this evening for this case, uh, there are no final development plans required, uh, so the applicant could come forward and apply for all the zoning certificates that are required for the case, uh, which would require them to meet the development standards that were being approved. With that, um, before you, you do have five findings of fact. Those five findings of fact are what generally are used to determine whether or not a case does meet our requirements for approval. Um, the first being the public road accessibility. The second, um, that the development standards address issues related to compatibility with adjacent uses. The third, that the proposed development and development standards produce a superior design and construction that will, than what would normally occur under standard zoning. D, the proposal is in accordance with the goals of the comprehensive plan. And E, the project is proposed to contain non-residential, which in this case, it does not. I say that just because of D. Um, there is a component about this with the comprehensive plan, and I just wanted to briefly mention um, D, uh, which goes into this location is within a, uh, an area in our comprehensive plan uh, that says that it has priority for PDA, which is our planned agriculture district. I would say that this district does not necessarily meet all of the standards of the PDA, um, but it certainly uh, is not, uh, in terms of acreage requirements, not creating a, uh, a large number of homes on a small amount of acreage. Um, also, uh, there was a growth boundary designated at the time, uh, and it is outside of that boundary. With that said, um, I would also uh, like to note 
the Zoning Commission recommendation for the record, and I will read all these into the record, even though it's in front of you now. Uh, I will formally read them into the record, but um, the Zoning Commission did recommend in a four to zero vote uh, approval of the findings of fact based on the public meeting with the following stipulations. One, the development standards dated August 8th, 2020 are adopted. Two, the developer provide on the record plan an appropriate public utility easement providing access to the public water and sewer connections between Aberdeen and parcel K45184140002 immediately to the west of the subdivision to extent permitted and approved by Montgomery County through the subdivision review process. The sewer and water main line shall be constructed in a manner that minimizes disruptions to the roadway upon future connections through these easements. Three, a document clearly showing how lot two and three are maintained through a homeowners association shall be provided prior to the issuance of any zoning certificates for the property. Four, the developer shall provide updated plans that reflect Montgomery County engineer's comments related to the site or provide documentation of acceptance by the Montgomery County engineer's office of an alternate solution. Five, the developer provides documentation of an executed maintenance agreement between the city of Miamisburg and Miami Township related to the future public roadway showing the city as maintaining that roadway. And six, a bike and pedestrian signal crossing is advocated for by the developer to the county engineer's office with a formal letter with an offer to pay for the cost of installation across Medler Road. So I wanted to note just one item on that. Um, so stipulation six was an item that was added by the zoning commission at the end of the meeting. Um, I did reach out to Montgomery County Engin engineer's office as well as the Miami Township Public Works Department. Um, and I just wanted to note a couple items on that. Um, the Montgomery County Engineer's Office stated that it's unlikely that a traffic signal would be warranted based on the volume of traffic and pedestrian activity. Uh, there has not been a study done to confirm that, but they felt that it would be unlikely it would be approved. Um, they also felt that there were other options that were likely available to achieve the same goal, uh, like school flashers or crossing guards, uh, to achieve the, um, the same protection or, or um, more protection than it would be with just a crosswalk. Um, they also noted, and this is just to have a note, that any long-term maintenance of any structures that were created, um, even if they were paid for by the developer, uh, the township would be obligated to maintain those uh, for perpetuity. Um, and then and finally, Montgomery County Engineer's Office would not support anything that isn't warranted. So uh, even if somebody wanted to build it and put it on the roadway, um, at their own expense, uh, it may not be safe. And so if it isn't warranted, uh, they are not willing to agree to allow something that potentially could be unsafe or um, could create a liability issue uh, if it does not meet the warrants that are necessary. So with that said, um, I know I've gone through a number of items. I'm more than happy to go back through any of those items if you have specific questions, uh, but I do believe there is a representative of the applicant here who can certainly speak to any questions uh, that you may have of them. Well, can you do, can you discuss the reference to condition number two, uh, providing the easement, which parcel this is and why an easement's necessary? Uh, so the easement uh, that this parcel is the property that is to the east of the property. Um, I think it's very likely um, Mr. Snyder may be able to answer this one better than I can if you want to jump in. Yeah, I can, I can provide a little bit of background on that, Mr. Posey. This, so this project is before Miami Township because there was a change in the in the develop, design of the development uh, when this developer came on. Originally, this road connection was going to be uh, further east on Medler Road, uh, just past the last house within the township. There, uh, it was essentially on the just on the edge of that uh, rise in the road out there. Uh, the developer felt uh, that this was a better location for the roadway. Um, it did move it away from the house that was that last house on Medler Road uh, by taking this house out um, and line, aligned the intersection with the, the school intersection across the street. So they approached the township about our willingness or desire to potentially permit this, they had to go through this process in order to get approval to uh, construct the house and subdivide the property in the way that uh, they're requesting. Um, as part of that, we did work with the developer 
because there was some interest with the adjacent homeowner to the west there, potentially uh, be able to tie into the water or sewer system in the future. Uh, we felt that obviously this was an impact on that homeowner having the roadway uh, adjacent to their property. Uh, in working with the developer, they agreed that it was relatively easy at this stage uh, because of the construction work that they were going to be doing to at least, at the very least, provide uh, the public easement because they controlled all of the property. So they can provide a public easement from where they were going to be extending it along the new road uh, to that property owner's uh, property line, which would allow them, if they so chose in the future, to connect and tie in uh, directly to the public uh, water and sewer system in that location. So the developer agreed uh, that that was something that they could provide. Um, at this point in time, they could also provide uh, some of the valve connections and things uh, and design, design the project so that that would be relatively easy to do in the future um, if the homeowner desired to do that. It would be at the homeowner's expense though in the future to uh, complete that connection. So with that, agreement from the developer, uh, that's the, the reason for that uh, clause in here. But that, that clause is in there with, with an understanding and agreement from the developer that they could provide that. Does that answer your question? It, it does. I'm just wondering, aren't there a few more houses along that row there that might benefit from such an easement? Or is this, was it just, this just addressing the only homeowner that requested it? Well, I was addressing the only one that requested it and potentially this homeowner, because of the grade of the land and where they're situated, it was possible to do that. I don't know from an engineering perspective if it would be, it, it wasn't, they're the most directly adjacent to where the new sewer line was going to be located with an ability to actually tap into that um, and, and easily have that easement extended to their property line it's not as easy to get to all of, all of the homeowners. The developer doesn't control the right of way or the land to get to all of the homeowners out there. So, but it was not something that was requested by um, the homeowner to the east, so. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Hinkleman? I just really quickly wanted to note as well, the, and I stated it at, um, a little bit ago, but I just want to be clear. I mean, this rezoning um, is a rezoning into a final development plan, even though it's an SPPUD. So that's, again, why they're just going to be applying for zoning certificates once, uh, if this is approved, um, that they will not have to come back for final development plans because this is this will act as the preliminary final uh, plan all in one. I do have one more question. I don't know if it's appropriate for, for Kyle or Chris to address um, how often circumstances like those identified in circumstance five uh, requesting a maintenance agreement come into play when the burdensome property is more in the township or the city or vice versa. Well, this is a unique situation. Again, this is a development uh, that is occurring on land that was annexed uh, not too long ago into the city of Miamisburg from the township. Uh, at that point in time, the city took over all of the, the uh, oversight over the design and approval process for the subdivision as a whole. Uh, we were not anticipating at that time that we were going to have any involvement because the design at that time called for all of the connections to be coming out of property that was in the city. Uh, when they approached us uh, recently about uh, potentially providing this connection, uh, the discussions that we had with the city and accommodating uh, the potential connection were that um, we would be open to a discussion on that with the understanding that the roadway though, if we were going to be providing the accommodation to the city in this case, that they would need to take on the maintenance responsibility for that roadway as we were not um, originally anticipating to have any maintenance responsibilities for the new subdivision streets. And in the long run, all of the homes all of the property tax that they will be generating um, once our agreement ends with the city will be uh, primarily 
being generated within the city of Miamisburg. So we felt it was appropriate to have that burden uh, be borne by the city in this case. So. And the city had agreed to that. So again, this was a, a clause that was put in place with understanding and agreement from all the parties. So. So, so the roadway referred to in that paragraph is the new roadway on off of Medler Road, not Medler Road itself. Correct. 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 Thanks. So this clause was simply meant to make sure that we get that final documentation before we issue uh, permits and stuff to the developer. So. Any further questions for Mr. Henkelman? Would the applicant like to come forward and say anything? Just for the record, please state your name and address for the record. All right, you should be able to speak now. Hello everybody, this is Bob Kronegold, 2880 Los Santaville Avenue with the Medler Development Group. Um, I don't have anything to add. Thank you, Kyle, for your presentation. I'm here to answer any questions for you. It was a very comprehensive presentation, pretty straightforward request, and I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody has. What are your anticipated um, sales for this development? How quickly do you think you'll get through it? Is it one large phase? Is it multiple phases? It's gonna be built in four phases. Uh, there'll be two different type products offered, a traditional two-story home and a single-story empty nester type product. So I would anticipate a four to five year sales pace. It'll be built in five phases. Um, if current market conditions persist, I think it'll be quicker than that, but there's no way to predict. That's currently what we're thinking. It's a four to five year build out. And will uh, both points of entry be immediately constructed or will one be constructed before the other? The Medler Road entrance will be constructed first and the Miami Spring Springboro uh, portion will be constructed probably within two years. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any further questions for the applicant? All right, the board will now hear from any proponents. Those in favor of the plan, please raise your hand. Not hearing or seeing anyone. Those opposed to the plan who would like to make a comment, please raise your hand at this time. All right, hearing none, we will close the public comment period on this particular zoning case. Uh, as has been said before, the Board of Trustees is required under Article 31, Section 3104 of the Miami Township Zoning Resolution to make specific findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at this hearing. The Board will now determine each of the required standards under Article 31, Section 3104. Will the Fiscal Officer please read and record each of the finding of fact for the record? Yes, can everybody hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Okay. The site will be accessible from public roads that are adequate to carry the traffic that will be imposed upon them by the proposed development standards, where only the proposed uses and development standards are to be adopted and provides for pedestrian accessibility and connectivity throughout the design. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Aye. Mr. Posey. Yes. The proposed development and or development standards adequately address issues related to compatibility with adjacent uses, environmental issues, and overall design compatibility, including lighting and landscaping, and do so in a manner that improves upon what could be achieved under the non-PD zoning standards. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp? Yes. Mr. Posey? Yes. The proposed development and or development standards are intended to produce a superior design and construction 
than what would normally occur under a non-PD zoning standards and will not cause an undue burden on public services and facilities, including but not limited to fire and police protection. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. Yes. The proposal is in accordance with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. Yes. If the project is proposed to contain non-residential uses, the conditions imposed mitigate any potential significant impacts associated with the proposal, including maintaining a minimum 50 foot distance from a retail office or other non-industrial business structure or a 100 foot distance from a manufacturing structure to a residential building outside of the planned development district with a minimum 30 foot property line setback for retail office or other non-industrial businesses use and 50 foot property line setback for manufacturing use along any property lines adjacent to the residential zone property. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. Mr. Posey. I think we lost him. No, now you're muted. You were on before, but we didn't hear you. Yeah. Uh, the, Terry, unmute yourself. Let me see. All right. How about now? There we go. There we go. I vote yes. Okay. That would be all the findings of fact. Excellent. Uh, with that, I will make a motion to close the public hearing for zoning case number 445-20. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Mr. Morris? Aye. Mr. Culp? Aye. Mr. Posey? Aye. I will make a motion we approve resolution 58-2020, a resolution to adopt a zoning map amendment from A Agricultural District to SP-PUD Special Purpose Planned Unit Development District under zoning case 445-20. Therefore, be it resolved, the Miami Township Board of Trustees approves the zoning map amendment under zoning case 445-20 and adopts the zoning commission recommendation. Is there a second? Second the motion. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. Mr. Posey. Aye. All right, I will now make a motion to open the public hearing for zoning case number 444-20. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Mr. Morris? Aye. Mr. Culp? Aye. Mr. Posey? Aye. Zoning case number 444-20 is now open. The following will be in order in which this hearing will proceed. Staff will give a report, then the applicant will have an opportunity to speak. Any proponents, those in favor of the plan, or opponents, those opposed, will have an opportunity to speak. The board will review and vote on the findings of fact for this case. The board will then close the public hearing and make a motion on the resolution concerning the case. The board will now hear a report from staff. Mr. Hankelman, have the legal requirements for this hearing been met? And do you have a recommendation for the Miami Township Zoning Commission? Thank you very much. Uh, they have, and yes, I do. I will read you uh, the Zoning Commission recommendation into the record uh, when I'm finished with my report. I will uh, share with you my screen once again. I will just make the assumption that you can see it. Yes, sir. Uh, time's a charm. <laughs> with that said, uh, the case that is before you is ZC444-20 a rezoning from A Agriculture to SPPUD. Uh, in this case, it is a preliminary development plan, uh, which we will talk about here in a moment. The location we are discussing this evening uh, is zoned agriculture. It is on the southern boundary or very close to the southern boundary of our community off of Wood Road, uh, just to the west side. It is south of Jane Chance Elementary School, uh, and one of the primary comments that I received 
um, as part of um, when, once we advertise this, as I discussed with residents, one of the concerns that they uh, stated very clearly was their concern that the elementary school baseball fields were being removed. Uh, so you can see those within this image. Uh, they are not part of the request this evening as they are owned and operated by the school uh, and have no, um, uh, whatever the board decides this evening, uh, doesn't have any control over the uh, baseball fields uh, in their location. These are a couple photos just to give you some context and we certainly can go back to these as we talk about different items. But um, the first photo on the top left shows you the property uh, looking to the south uh, and then we kind of turn just a little bit and the, the photo on the top right. Uh, and then this is the, uh, the bottom left shows you the woods, uh, which would be lot five. Um, and then the bottom right shows you uh, the cul-de-sac standing on the school's property looking towards lot two. Uh, this is up a little bit close to lot five, basically the line between lot two and lot five, looking towards uh, the south. And then this is those baseball fields that are, are located not on the property. Uh, they're actually across the street. So with that said, the request this evening uh, is for uh, a rezoning to allow a preliminary development plan that includes a lot layout, which includes five lots. Uh, as well as the creation of development standards for the development, uh, which uh, regulate the use as well as a number of other items, which we will discuss in a moment. Um, the five lots that are being proposed, uh, lot one is the Miami Valley Fire District Fire Station. Lot two is our public works facility. Lot three uh, is a proposed uh, development lot. Lot four is a private drive. Uh, and lot five would be an additional development or proposed future development lot. Uh, as part of this development, as many of you are aware, uh, bringing this forward was due to lot three, uh, having a potential purchaser. Uh, that potential purchaser is looking to build uh, on lot three. They are looking to build a specific use, which is a sports training facility on that lot. Um, as part of this, this evening, uh, that use is what is being permitted, not the actual building location or the other components of the building, like landscaping or lighting or setbacks. Um, although the general development setbacks and landscaping are being proposed and uh, would be approved this evening if you move forward, um, the applicant would, in this case, have to come back for a final development plan for lot three that would show their building, which would have building designs and elevations, uh, as well as show their landscaping, lighting, uh, and all other uh, utilities. With that said, there is a representative of lot three, I believe, uh, that is here. And if you have any specific questions of that representative, I certainly can have you speak with them now, or if you'd like during the um, proponents and opponents section to have him speak at that time, we certainly can do that as well. Kyle, there was one question that was brought forward by a resident talking about the amount of parking spaces that are being proposed. Are those requirements that are within our zoning standards based on the size of the building or are those based on the request of the developer? So our standards for a retail user um, would be one per 250. This is a uh, 10,000 square foot building which would get you about 40 spaces, um, I believe. Uh, and that is basically what the applicant is asking for. Now, I certainly would say the applicant can speak to why they are proposing the overall number of spaces. And as we go to the final development plan process, we will look into that and be very clear in what our expectations would be for parking. Um, but our, our requirement would be to have a minimum, we don't have a maximum. We, we have a minimum number uh, and we would just be requiring the applicant in the final development plan process to meet that minimum number. Um, but if there is more than that, then the applicant certainly can speak to why they are proposing more parking than what our code would require. So you're saying our requirement on this size building would be approximately 40 spaces? I, what, it would be 10,000 divided by 250. 
Your math was good. So that is authority. Okay. Okay. I was right. Just checking. Yeah. Um, and the reason, and we, the reason why we have those requirements is because in the future we don't want a building there with five parking spaces that becomes uh, someone else who wants to acquire the building and then it has no use to them because they have to build a parking lot. Well, and again, our office standard would be one per thir 300 um, and our restaurant standard is one point or one per 100. So the, the standards change depending on the use. Uh, in this case, um, although the applicant may not be looking for that much parking, um, if the building were to ever um, be replaced, then maybe that would be um, the need. Uh, also, as part of these development standards, we certainly can reduce those standards and put in a specific number if that is something that the board uh, would like to see as a reduced number. Uh, if the applicant, uh, or he's not the applicant at this, this stage, but the potential purchaser of lot three was agreeable to having less parking, um, obviously there are always some concerns with that. So this is, a, this is a preliminary plan, a final plan, as you stated, has to come forward. But in this preliminary plan, there is an existing tree line that is being maintained all across lot three. Um, again, the final development plan would look at all of the trees, um, but the, the development standards that you see before you, which we will talk about in a, a moment, show uh, a required buffer on all buffers next to residential properties. Thank you. So again, as I did in the previous case, uh, I'll just note a couple different standards that are proposed within the development standards. Um, some general uses that are proposed at this time um, would limit the overall uh, uses to government facilities, residential, including assisted living facilities and general office. Uh, and then specifically on lot three, they would have testing labs, medical equipment supply, light assembly, sports performance training, and physical therapy. Um, I would note these were the proposed uses uh, within the development standards. As we talk about the recommendation from the Zoning Commission, uh, there were some modifications to these uses. This is just again to show you the aerial about which lots we're, we're discussing there. Mr. Hinkleman, I would also note the uses proposed for lot three that are in addition to the sports training and rehab uses were uses that were requested by that potential buyer for lot three. So they did request approval for the additional uses in the event that they would ever again have to sell the building. So um, I just wanted you to understand where those where those were coming from. Those were what was specifically requested by that purchaser. Yeah, thank Mr. You. Snyder or Mr. Hankelman, from my own knowledge, uh, is that the, the two facilities that are on this land now that is currently zoned agriculture, our public works facility and the fire station, there's no requirement that the public government needed to rezone that to build those facilities? That is correct. Right. Both of those facilities are permitted uses in the agricultural district. Thank you. So just to note, the development standards also prohibit uses. Uh, so by removing uh, the A designation, there are a number of uses that would be removed from the ability to develop um, certain farming uh, operations, but there also are ex explicit standards uh, that are being or uses excuse me that are being prohibited um, two of which are the communication towers so no cell towers uh, and no billboards i wanted to note that the, there is a proposal for signage along wood road which would serve all of the lots uh, there currently is an existing sign that states miami township uh, on it right now so this would be uh, in addition to that existing sign as I stated uh, briefly before, uh, the landscaping buffers, with, which you will see spelled out within the development standards, are substantial. Uh, generally within our community, we do not uh, have a 75-foot uh, setback. We also do not require a 30-foot landscape buffer unless it is between industrial uses and residential uses. Uh, so this proposed buffer was uh, much more than what we generally would require, uh, but I would certainly say 
as part of our discussions at the Zoning Commission, uh, the buffer was a very large item that was a concern of a number of people, uh, as well as our Zoning Commission had a lot of concerns about making sure that that buffer is protected uh, and it is substantial enough if any development were to occur. So can you just reiterate what you just said? Um, what does this buffer really mean? Uh, because we've got residents on both sides that have approached me and said, well, I would like to buy that 30 foot piece of land. And the south section as an example, I think on the drawing show, it's like 390 feet. And if you go 390 by 30 feet, that's you know roughly a third or, or a, of an acre. Uh, they were, are proposing, well, I wanna buy that to make sure it never gets developed. Are you saying that these buffers basically say they're not to be developed by anyone? Correct. I mean, the intention of those buffers would be that they stay a buffer. Now, what I cannot tell you for certain is if that buffer includes every tree that exists within that buffer today, or if that gets cleared out and put native trees or something else in there in the future. It is very likely, though, that that 30 feet will never be touched by anything um, because that is a protected area. If they were to remove anything, they would likely have to replace it at what I would estimate to be a, a, a substantial cost. Um, and again, I just wanna be clear that that does not mean that they would have to keep every tree in there forever, um, but they would be required to never build within that 30 feet. So um, the 30 foot buffer will always exist in that location. I can't say for certain what that form would be, but it would never have any construction in it. With that said, that 75 foot setback would not have a building ever constructed in it, but it could potentially have parking. So no parking within 30 feet, no structure within 75 feet. That is what the development standards are proposing at this time. Thank you. So within your, um, Development standards, you'll also see there is a requirement to meet our lighting standards of Article 7, uh, which I just state uh, because anything that gets developed now uh, would have LED lights and they're downward facing, so it would reduce the amount of light pollution in the area. Do our standards say that that LED lighting must be white? Our uh, standards do not allow white. We actually do have a Kelvin um, in our Article 7, so Instead of that really, really, really blue light, um, we require it to be a little more yellow, um, which I believe we're in the 4,000 to 5,000 um, Kelvin range. So a specific color temperature is mandated. You couldn't Correct. put red LED in there. Correct. It would I need to be the right Kelvin, which I don't know. I am not a scientist, but I don't believe it's possible to accommodate that. Believe it or not, I was a lighting designer at one time in my life, and I do know Kelvin, so <laughs> one thing I do know. Um, with that, uh, you'll also see within your development standards or proposed development standards, uh, the design guidelines for structures. Uh, so after discussing with a number of residents, their concerns about future development, um, you'll see the height requirement or restriction is two stories or 35 feet, whichever is less. So if somebody wanted to build a, a two-story building, um, they would never exceed 35 feet no matter what. Um, so uh, whatever that structure would be, whatever use it would be, it could not be taller than 35 feet. Uh, you'll also see that a portion of the structure would be required to be brick or stone. Um, the intention of the design guidelines in this area uh, really deal with the institutional uses, uh, the fire station, public works, and school, and the residential uses, uh, where this area would be more of a transition uh, from those into the, the residential homes, which uh, are, are substantially brick and stone, but also have other materials as part of them. The private roadway, lot four, uh, also uh, would be maintained on a separate agreement by all owners in the development. Um, and all of the stormwater, uh, which is uh, a weak situation in that area, but it all would have to meet Montgomery County Engineer's Office. Um, and all of those plans would be required to come forward as final development plans come forward uh, if they were to ever be developed on lot three or lot five. 
as I did before, um, the zoning commission met last month or last week, excuse me, the board of trustees is voting tonight, 30 day referendum period, same as the other one. Uh, it is a rezoning in the state of Ohio. Um, and again, this though would require final development plans for lot three and lot five. At this time, we do not have any plans uh, before us for lot five. So I couldn't give you a timeline on an estimated time where that final development plan would come back before the board. Um, but lot three likely will come back before the board either this fall or next spring with a final development plan if the board were to approve uh, the uses and development standards uh, proposed uh, as part of this rezoning this evening. Just so I can note, before you get to your findings of fact again, the component on the comprehensive plan. Uh, this location is a unique uh, location within our community uh, because our comprehensive plan uh, really designates it in, as two different items, one of which it deals as suburban single family detached residential. Um, the other is within the Austin Interchange Land Use Plan. So the Austin Interchange Land Use Plan covers uh, everything that went in around the interchange. That plan was done before the interchange actually existed uh, with goals for some of the development around it. Um, so it was designated both ways. Um, the, obviously the single family residential district is pretty straightforward. The Austin interchange land use plan uh, really looked at it as public buildings, uh, mainly because those are the only public buildings uh, that were proposed at the time. But the goals and policies uh, within the different documents uh, also cover this location. And again, the goals and policies of this area were to encourage future development to, to take place where public water service is available um, and to limit commercial areas around properties in close proximity to Austin Road. Uh, so not to expand west if, if development were to occur. With that said, um, you have the findings of fact before you uh, for your consideration. And the Zoning Commission did recommend in a four to zero vote approval of zoning case 444-20 based on the findings of fact of the public hearing with the following stipulations. One, the development standards dated August 18th, 2020 are adopted with the modifications below. Two, lot five as presented is limited to park use only. Three, Cranes Run HOA has first right of refusal for the purchase of lot five and maintain as a park or open space. And four, the Board of Trustees will negotiate with Mimesburg City Schools to address challenges related to sports park, sports field parking along private drive in lot four. So as I did with the previous case, I just wanted to note, um, we did speak with the school district uh, about uh, the um, challenges with sports, park, sports field parking. Um, the question uh, the school had, as well as, as township staff, really is, is the challenges of, of the parking. Um, both parties are aware that there are events that occur there, but neither has witnessed a situation where it is a concern or where the parking becomes such a concern that it is not able to be used. Um, but the school did state there are, they, they have additional land. Uh, they actually have a curb cut on the circle uh, out there. And there is additional land where they could park additional cars if it became a concern. Um, but, but they agreed uh, that they would work with the township uh, to understand any, any concerns if in the future uh, it was noted that there was something from a safety issue that was occurring. With that said, uh, if there are any questions that you have of me, I certainly can address those. Um, if there's any questions that you have, um, Obviously, we are the applicant in this case. So if Mr. Snyder, if you want to ask, add anything, you certainly can add anything that I did not address. Um, but with that said, if there's anything I can answer, I certainly will attempt to do so. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Hinkleman on his report? All right, thank you, Mr. Hankelman. We will uh, now look to move into the public comment period. Uh, here's what I'd like to recommend. Um, the board has been given the report from the Zoning Commission as well as a detailed finding from um, the staff. And so I would really encourage those who wanna come forward 
uh, to be brief to the point. We're going to put a limit of three minutes on each speaker. And I will note a number of the items that have already been presented to this board. Uh, a number of residents have expressed a desire that Lot 5 be preserved as open space. A number have requested Lot 5 be kept in agricultural. Mr. Hinkleman, if this was kept agricultural, would any of the buffers that you've shown be mandated? So the actual protection um, in terms of the landscape buffer would not be required. The only buffer that would be required would be a 50 foot um, front and rear yard uh, buffer and a 30 foot side yard for a single family house. Um, with that said, then, you know, a, an accessory structure or anything like that could be six feet from the property line. So conceivably, this could be a dairy farm, a cow farm, a pig farm, and they could run their property right up to the property line. And I would clarify that's a 50 foot rear yard setback, not a not a buffer. So that that's Correct. just building setback, but there's no there is no requirement for landscaping. So and you talked about height in, in the agricultural district. What's the height? Uh, what's the maximum height you could put in there under it now? So it would depend. Um, generally, it's 40 feet. But I would say if it's an agricultural use, uh, many of those like a silo or something like that could potentially be exempt under state code. So they could go beyond that if they needed to. But 40 feet is generally our height requirement within the township. Thank you. Uh, there have been uh, requests that the HOA have the ability to buy some of all or lot five. That was in the Zoning Commission's recommendation. There were questions about traffic, both regarding students in uh, pickup times as well as the uh, sports fields. There was a general concern of the safety of children. There was a desire to preserve trees, uh, requests about additional buffers, talks about the property should only be used for school facilities. Uh, and other parking issues. So again, we will open up the public comment period. If you would like to speak in favor or against the plan, again, bring raise your hand. First, we're gonna go with proponents, those uh, who are in favor of the plan. So if you may have inadvertently raised your hand and you are opposed, uh, please take your hand down momentarily. Those in favor of the plan, uh, or if the applicant for lot three would like to say anything, uh, please come forward. I will start. Um, please state your name for the record um, and your address. It is the applicant for lot three. Matt, you are there? Yes, I'm here. Right, there you go. Yeah, my name is Matt Muncie. I live at 1061 Decker Drive. Lifelong resident of this area. Started our business 10 years ago this fall. Uh, because I felt like it was my true calling, um, had success over the years, um, positively influenced many lives, uh, worked with many different school districts in the area, and have leased all this time. And a couple years ago, I really took a long process to try to find what our next step would be, knowing that we were committed to doing this for a very long time, and it didn't make sense to continue to lease anymore. And um, we were lucky enough to have this opportunity. Um, that the township let us in on. Um, definitely the best opportunity for us moving forward from here. It's going to do wonders for our business. We want to be a great neighbor and we don't want to be any type of nuisance here. Again, we're very thankful for this opportunity. And um, yeah, that's really all I have to say. And I'm also um, welcome to answer any questions that anybody else has for me. Any questions for Mr. Muncie? All right, thank you for coming forward. Mr. Hankelman, are there any other proponents, those in favor of the plan? Sorry, just a moment. Let me. Can I? Uh, so we have one, uh, Mandy, are you a proponent? Okay, um, let me 
Mandy, are you there? Yeah. Am I unmuted? Yes. Uh, yes, I um, am really appreciative that you guys suggested that this only be parks. Um, knowing what else it could be, I am a proponent because I think building anything there is just going to end up being a waste. It's a beautiful area. There is tons of wildlife back there, and I think that there's a lot of land over off of Austin that is started to be built, and we are not finished with that yet. So I don't understand why we would be looking for new areas to build anything when we haven't finished with what we've started. I appreciate you guys suggesting that it only be parks. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Anyone else coming forward with comments in favor of the plan? All right, we will uh, close the portion of the zoning meeting for hearing from those in favor of the plan and we'll now open up to those who are opposed to the rezoning plan. Again, uh, raise your hand. You will be called upon. Please state your name and address for the record and you will be given three minutes to offer your comments to the board. We have two people, the first of which is Eric Napier. Eric, there? Yeah, thank you. Just a couple questions and then a couple Could you state your name uh, and address for the record, please? Thank you. Yes, I will. Eric Napier, 10997 Wood Road. Thank you. Uh, first question, uh, well, first two pertaining to lot three. Um, does the planning development limit the number of businesses that can be built on that lot? It seems like uh, there were some pretty specific uses added to that so it seems like the plans are there so can they limit the number of businesses also um did i misread it but i was under the impression that there was a difference in the building materials required between lot three and lot five pertaining to lot five i'm under the impression that there are three acres within that eight acres that are not considered uh, developable can someone please share what that means and where that is uh, the last one's kind of a comment um, based upon the earlier zoning uh, case that you heard before. It was interesting that uh, two out of the four lots there that were being rezoned were being rezoned into a buffer zone and green space. So uh, they also were protecting and writing in there that they were protecting the existing trees and uh, a specific landscape plan, uh, whether that will be included in this uh, proposal also mm -hmm. pertaining to the buffer on the south side uh, next to our home uh, again I asked the question the other day and I'm still not sure I understand the answer the 30 foot buffer uh, right now there's a 15 foot or larger easement going down the property line for the uh, town or for the county water and sewer uh, so that really can't be considered a buffer if you can't plant or allow trees to grow on that. Uh, so where does that buffer fit on that property? And uh, then the last one is just the comments. You know, uh, 15 years ago when the comprehensive land plan was written, this the residents stated no businesses in this area. And I think with the zoning meeting last week, um, residents in the area also spoke that businesses should not be considered in this area. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I will uh, hear from some of the other opponents and then uh, bring your questions before the staff before we uh, close the meeting. Uh, other, other opponents of the plan with comments or questions? I have Stephen Wilson. Mr. Wilson? Hello, yes. I would like Can to thank of trustees. Your name and address. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate what everyone does here. I love being a, a resident of Cranes Run for the last 10 years, and I live on Nestling Drive right behind the uh, abutting property of uh, Lot 5. Um, I guess I'm both for and against the plan. I understand the township's initial position is not to divide uh, the lots any further. And in that case, the Zoning Commission recommended that the lots be rezoned SPPUD and that Lot 5 be designated park use only. Um, the concerns of the neighbors I spoke with are safety, traffic, and noise, and 
not to mention property values and preservation of green space and natural ecosystems of the, of the wooded lot. Um, I believe the intention of the Zoning Commission was to reach a compromise by agreeing to the rezoning efforts of all the lots while preserving Lot 5 from future development until a specific plan is proposed and approval is then sought. We can, we can just go through the process again then um, by attaching that rider of a, of a um, park use only. And I do believe consensus of rezoning development of uh, Lots 1 through 4 was met and that all parties were heard and a majority of the people agreed to the building on lot three for Mr. Muncie as well. It was just a raw nerve was struck in uh, reducing the existing natural buffers between this lot and the neighborhood. Um, I do know the Zoning Commission suggests the right of first refusal to the Homeowners Association also as a rider to that, to that lot five. And um, I do believe there is room for further compromise and talking to my neighbors and the HOA board members that, I've, that I spoke to. Um, you may already have a buyer for that, for that buffer area on the lot five if you agree to discussions with the uh, HOA. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to uh, also say that this is a, uh, put this on the record that a, a, about this specific property, it um, is a sensitive topic because it's, it's zoned agricultural because it was originally a privately owned farm that was donated for school use. And sort of that was our understanding when the residential neighborhoods uh, were established and people moved here. Um, rezoning, selling to the highest bidder and developing uh, for other purposes, a gift property just doesn't reflect our community values well. And I don't think it's a good look for the township. So um, I'd like to see this process find compromise and common ground to get buy-in from uh, all, the, all the parties involved. And um, I just appreciate you guys' uh, consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Other individuals wishing to come forward in opposition of the plan? I have Greg Smith. Greg, you there? Yes, can you hear me? Can you state your name and address for the record, please? My name is Greg Smith. My address is uh, 30, uh, 4345 Woodthrush Court, Miamisburg, Ohio. I'm here to see me representing the Cranes Run Homeowners Association. Um, Several of our members have expressed some concern, uh, largely those who are along that uh, share a property line with lot number five. Um, I was made aware of the recommendations that came uh, to us from the uh, Zoning Commission and our board has had a chance to meet since that meeting. Uh, we met last Thursday and we would welcome um, some discussions with the township to actually acquire a buffer along that property line. Uh, the board is of the opinion that most of our residents do have a buffer behind our property of one kind or the other, most of the time put there by the developer when the subdivision was originally built. We also thought it was reasonable for the people who live along that property line to have felt like they had a similar buffer when they acquired their homes, being they had trees behind their houses at that time, and it was a school use at that time for the most part. So the board thought it would be reasonable as for us to um, at least make an attempt, a good faith effort to acquire uh, a buffer along that property line if the uh, trustees were looking to sell. Um, I don't know that we're really interested in buying the entire five acres, but uh, we would be willing to talk about a uh, buffer if one is available. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to come forward? I have Kathleen Bradley. Kathleen, are you there? Hi there, I am here. Thank you. I'm Kathleen Bradley, 4275 Rose Ridge Way. I'm also in a Cranes Run homeowner. And I came here from the initial when the property opened. And again, we thought we were moving into the country. And that has greatly, vastly changed. Uh, when I can remember, Austin Landing used to be a tree farm. And one of the facts that I brought up last week is that we have seen through the a Miami Township land plan that neighbors really want to see green space kept and developed. The other part that I saw uh, on the facts that was provided is that that green space keeps decreasing. And I think I'm fine with uh, Mr. Muncie having his business, but I'm sure he wouldn't want to go forward if they were gonna move agricultural and have a silo and cows and whatever was mentioned before. Um, I'm hoping that we can make lot five 
a green space that was donated land. And I'd like to see my neighbors on Nestling and Cranes Run. We have a walkway there. It's used quite frequently by our neighborhood. Uh, we have had a lot more noise and traffic and disruption uh, with the development of all the land in this neighborhood. And I understand where we have to kind of develop that. I get it. But I also want to try to keep where we can have sort of that former country feel that we had back in the day. And I hope, thank you for your time. And respectfully, I hope that you will make zone five or lot five green space. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to come forward? I have Mr. Napier again. Would you like to hear second a second round? Mr. Posey or Mr. Culp, are you opposed to giving Mr. Napier another couple minutes? All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. And this is Eric Napier, 10997 Wood Road. Sorry, this is quick. Um, the uh, if you agree to allow the homeowners association right of first refusal to purchase that property, uh, we would also like to be included in that right of first refusal. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Anyone else, Mr. Hankelman? I All right. do not see any other hands. I will uh, close the public comment period. Uh, before going into uh, the findings of fact, I'd like the staff to address a few of the questions that were brought forward. Um, Mr. Hankelman or Mr. Snyder, can you address uh, what would, so right now there are no proposals for any development on lot five. This is just dividing it into a piece of property that the township still owns, giving us the capability to hear proposals on that land. Is there anything that would happen today if this were approved that would prevent us from further subdividing, selling a piece to Mr. Napier or the HOA uh, in the future? We would, we would need to modify, if, if you approve the plan as it's shown today, and then later decided you wanted to subdivide, say lot five, or sell off a piece of it, then there would need to be a modification to the essentially approved preliminary development plan that we've laid out here today. So the lot lines would need to be adjusted and then that would need to be reapproved by the board. I do wanna note one other item that was brought up a couple of times in the comments that the, the land was previously donated to the school district. That's actually not correct. The land was sold uh, to the school district. So that was not a land donation, uh, but it was, was in fact sold by the previous uh, property owner to the school district. Yeah, I was going to mention that. I thought there was some mythology there that, that there was this land was donated. If, if you could make sure I understand it, I believe the, the entire property that the school and the town, the part that the township now owns was sold for something like 1.5 to 1.8 million. And then, and then the township subsequent to that paid approximately 500 to 600,000 for the portion that we have. Uh, which allows to go around twenty-eight thousand dollars per acre. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, just to clarify what you just said, again, if the township were to receive offers from the HOA, Mr. Napier, or anyone else, or any organization coming forward that said they just want a piece of Lot Five, we could then bring a modified plan back to the Zoning Commission and request that Lot Five be subdivided. Correct. Uh, Mr. Snyder, aren't there some restrictions on sale of property uh, that may, may require an actual auction if we were desiring to do that? Yeah, again, I'm just addressing the, the zoning plan in terms of the, from the zoning process, in terms of the legal process for the township to transfer property to a private property owner. There are restrictions under the Ohio Revised Code. I know our law director has been reviewing that. I think that is something that certainly we would need to have a discussion between the law director and the board of trustees regarding the exact uh, process for how that can be done because uh, it is my understanding there are restrictions on our ability to simply transfer directly to a private property owner without 
going through some type of public auction or sealed bid process. Mr. Snyder, Mr. Hankelman, one of the earlier questions was regarding the types of businesses that could be allocated into lot three. There were three or four different business types listed, but the proposal calls for one single structure. So the types of businesses could vary or there could be multiple types of businesses in one building, but there couldn't be three different buildings built. It's a, the plan is for that one building, correct? Correct. The final development plan would have to come forward with an actual building. So that building would allow potentially, I guess you could have two entrances and have multiple uses within that, but you as the final development, you as the board approving the final development plan are approving it for what it is. So if that were to ever modify or be modified, it would go back before the, the final development plan process. Excellent. And last, uh, Mr. Snyder or Mr. Hankelman, I believe this, this was knowledge that I had heard and conveyed to a resident. Uh, at some point in the past, the board was in discussions and this is eight acres on lot five, but realistically only five of it is, is developable. Is, where did that number come from or did, was I mistaken in when I heard that? I, I don't know where exactly five but there are some restrictions particularly on the north side of the lot uh, because of the existing stormwater basin on that location so there's a stormwater easement uh, that covers a portion of the property it's not not a large portion and then between the buffers uh, and again any additional stormwater uh, control or mitigation that would be required on there plus extending the road uh, you are going to chew up effectively probably an acre or two acres of the property. So that might get you down to in the range of six acres or so, uh, give or take a little, you know, half an acre on either side of that, so. I'd also note, Mr. Morris, just so you're, uh, I mean, from the zoning side, obviously it would come back, but I would also say we would have to work with the Montgomery County Engineer's Office to understand um, what platting requirements would be if we were to plat off a small portion of a lot, um, if it was, cut and tied, that would be one thing, but the creation of a lot separately without public frontage would be another consideration we would have to make. Thank you. Mr. Posey or Mr. Culp, do you have any other questions for the staff? I do not. All right, uh, thank you. The Board of Trustees is required under Article 31, Section 3104 of the Miami Township Zoning Resolution to make a specific findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at this hearing. The Board will now determine each of the required standards under Article 31, Section 3104. Will the Fiscal Officer please read and record each of the findings of fact for the record? Yes, can everybody hear me again? Yes, sir. All right. The site will be accessible from public roads that are adequate to carry the traffic that will be imposed upon them by the postponed or proposed development. Standards where only the proposed uses and development standards are to be adopted and provides for pedestrian accessibility and connectivity throughout the design. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. He said yes. Okay. The proposed development and or development standards adequately address issues related to compatibility with adjacent uses, environmental issues, and overall design capability, including lighting and landscaping, and do so in a manner that approves upon what could be achieved under a non-PD zoning standard. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. You're muted, Terry. Hey. I apologize, I, uh, yes. The proposed development and or development standards are intended to produce a superior design and construction than what would normally occur under a non-PD zoning standards and will not cause an undue burden on public services and facilities, including, but not limited to, fire and police protection. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. Yes. The proposal is in accordance with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan. Mr. Morris. Yes. 
Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. Yes. If the project is proposed to contain non-residential uses, the conditions imposed mitigate any potential significant impacts associated with the proposal, including maintaining a minimum 50 foot distance from a retail office or other non-industrial business structure or 100 foot distance from a manufacturing structure to a residential building outside of the plan development district with a minimum 30 foot property line setback for retail. Office or non-industrial business uses and 50 foot property line setback for manufacturing use along any property lines adjacent to the residential zone property. Mr. Morris. Yes. Mr. Culp. Yes. Mr. Posey. Yes. And that concludes the findings of fact. Back to you, Mr. Morris. Thank you. I will, uh, in a moment, make a motion to close this public hearing. After the closing of the hearing, uh, we will discuss a motion. Uh, the motion will probably take one of three uh, tacks. There will, there could be a motion to approve as the zoning board has uh, recommended. Uh, there could be a motion to deny the zoning board recommendation, or there could be a motion with uh, adaptations or changes to their recommendation. Uh, so I will make a motion to close public hearing for zoning case number 444-20 and find that all of the required standards have been met by the evidence presented during the meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. Mr. Posey. Aye. Would someone like to bring forward a motion on resolution 57 regarding zoning case 444-20? Yeah, I'll move to adopt the zoning map, a resolution to adopt a zoning map amendment from A, Agricultural District to SPPUD Special Purpose Planned Unit Development District under zoning case number 444-20. Uh, therefore, be it resolved that the Miami Township Board of Trustees approves the zoning map amendment under zoning case number 444-20 and modifies with stipulations noted in exhibit A, the recommendation from the zoning commission and eliminates all of the zoning conditions except for number one. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I would like to talk about why I'm recommending uh, eliminating the zoning conditions, especially the right of first refusal and the park designation. Uh, this is real estate owned by the township and the township has specific purposes for which it can dispose of property, including real estate. The action we're taking today is a preliminary development plan. That's not a final development plan. And so many of the concerns that are addressed today are certainly heard and understood and will be kept in mind. But the only specific forthcoming plan we have is the one for lot three, which requires this plan to even be brought for a final plan before this board again. Um, given some of the concerns that were expressed and things that would need to be explored regarding the legality of disposing of the lot five, either giving Cranes Run Homeowners Association a right of reverse refusal or designated only for park purposes, um, that's a zoning restriction in this preliminary format that I think is inappropriate at this stage. But rest assured your concerns are heard and that the development that would occur for lot five will certainly take those into account in the future. There's just nothing we're presented with that would mandate adopting those restrictions as part of a preliminary plan as even legal or appropriate, despite how well-intentioned and understood it is. And many of the elements of the plan that's presented by the Zoning Commission today address many of the concerns that you're stating with regards to setbacks and maintaining a wooded environment. I would, I would also like to comment. I. I I think it's always interesting uh, when we have these, and for many who are on this call and watching this recorded or live, uh, this may be the only zoning case you've ever been to. Uh, we've had a number of zoning cases very similar to this in the last three years that I've been serving in this position. And invariably in every case, no one comes forward in favor of the plan except the developer. And the only people who come forward opposed to the plan are directly uh, adjacent to the property. Uh, there's, a, there's an unfortunate reality in our society in that we want development, but we don't want it next door to us. 
and sometimes boards have to make unfortunate decisions. I don't believe it's in the best interest of this township to tie the hands of our economic development department from bringing forward proposals that may be in the best interest of the, uh, the township. So as Mr. Posey said, uh, he has some questions over the legality of us giving first right of refusal. I have questions over the, the viability of why we would wanna restrict uh, options there. Uh, again, this is a preliminary plan. Nothing is planned for lot five. Nothing may come forward for five days, five months, five years, five decades for that piece of property. Uh, as has been pointed out, it has sat vacant for its entire lifetime and it may sit that way for a long period of time. So I am in agreement that these restrictions uh, do not make sense. And I don't wanna to pander to those residents into believing if they were passed today, that it would be an, a, uh, an eternal solution. The reality is five years from now, a new group of trustees could bring forward a modification to turn it into away from green space. So it's incumbent on everyone to stay active and involved in government. And should this uh, be approved with modifications, uh, rest assured you will be uh, informed and we will have future discussions if any development is brought forward. And the HOA and the residents, if you're interested in purchasing this property, uh, Mr. Snyder's information is available on our website and he is open and welcome to take your proposals. Mr. Culp, do you have any comments? I do not. There is a motion and a second. I believe you can take a vote, Mr. Newell. Yep, Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. Mr. Posey. Aye. Thank you. Uh, moving back to our agenda, we are at the part of department head comments. Any department heads wishing to come forward? No. Mr. Stegelmeyer, I would like to, uh, Chief, thank you for your most detailed police report. Um, I had asked the Chief a question of clarification on some of the crime statistics uh, regarding that, you know, DUI arrests were up 24% weapons violations up 159%, intimidation up 92%. My question to the chief was, are we seeing a rapid increase in, in crimes of this matter? And chief, would you share with me what your response was? If the board uh, would remember several months ago, I instituted a special operations uh, attachment to the police department. And basically what that is, is just redeploying some of our uniformed personnel into a more directed, uh, concentrated patrol in our hotspot areas and as a result of that you can see there's been more arrests in the types of offenses that you just uh, stated uh, so in essence I guess those uh, units have been working and uh, doing their jobs properly so we've been pretty successful and that's why you see those numbers increase um, we're being more proactive we're trying to keep the township as safe as we possibly can with the resources we have and uh, we're trying to think outside the box every way we can to uh, accomplish our goals within our uh, budgetary constraints and our manpower. So. I'm very appreciative of that, Chief. I'm glad to see that the uh, township is getting a good rate of return on its investment in additional officers and you're doing great work. So thank you for that. All right, uh, elected officials comments, Mr. Culp. I have none. Mr. Posey. Yeah, as I said last time, we had a contentious zoning case or a zoning case which brought a lot of participation. Uh, this is part of the reason I think America is the greatest country in the world is the ability of its citizens to directly speak to the people uh, making decisions that affect their lives. I would encourage anyone who has comments and receives notification of, uh, of pay attention to the agenda. You may have comments on things other than zoning cases that would be useful for us to hear. Thank you. Yeah, and I would like to echo those comments, uh, Mr. Posey. And, you know, it, it's very hurtful when I hear things like the trustees don't care about the residents. Uh, we're not here for any other reason than to do what we believe is in the best interest of the township. And unfortunately, we're not gonna make everyone happy all of the time, uh, but we, we do take into consideration everything that has been proposed. A lot of folks make comments, well, your decision was made before you even had your meeting. The reality is, Yes, we have studied the issue and came in with some idea of where it might go. That is our duty as trustees. Uh, some of these zoning cases have over 100 pages of documents that we have to study in advance of the meeting. We would be remiss 
in not doing our due diligence in advance of the meeting and only coming in and listening to a couple of, of quick comments. So again, thank the residents for getting engaged. And I apologize for those that believe that they didn't get notice. The reality is, is we do send those notices out, uh, but invariably people get a lot of junk mail and they see something that they don't, haven't recognized it before and it goes into file 13 right in the trash can. And uh, we've all done that before. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can find as many ways as possible. Follow us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, get into the social media aspects, and uh, all these notices are posted on social media in addition to snail mail and newspaper postings as required. So thank you all for participating in that. Uh, moving forward, uh, Mr. Newell, do you have any comments? No, I have none. I will make a motion to go into work session at 740. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. Mr. Posey. Aye. All right, Mr. Snyder, we have a discussion on the Land Bank Commission. Hey, good evening, board. Uh, Mr. Ankleman, can you give me the ability to share my screen? You're good. Okay. Just go to the bottom and click share screen. All right, if everyone can see this, I'll go uh, quickly through this. I know that you've had some of the background information previously on this, so certainly stop me if you have any questions. But we do have a property. The reason we're bringing this uh, discussion item to you is we do have a property that was uh, destroyed in a fire off of Farmington Road earlier this year. And we have been looking at uh, resources and mechanisms for potentially removing the remains of that property, about uh, three quarters of the house was destroyed. It is a tax delinquent property. Uh, the property owner had effectively abandoned the property prior to the fire. Um, the uh, tax company that had a lien on the property has expressed to us that they have no interest in removing the debris. So it is a potential hazard uh, to the public and in inviting of uh, further dumping on site. As part of our investigation into looking at how to remove that, uh, the land bank of Montgomery County did uh, notify us recently that they were beginning a new program utilizing some of their own internal funds uh, that would provide the ability for communities to remove uh, blighted properties in, in the township or in, in cities. Uh, this program would be a one-to-one -one match of uh, local dollars with land bank dollars for the removal of these properties. Uh, we did utilize a similar program, the Neighborhood Initiative Program, uh, that they had received uh, federal grant dollars from. Uh, that program paid 100% of the removal, uh, but was uh, structured a little bit differently. And one of the advantages of this particular program would be that uh, we could utilize uh, our nuisance abatement process uh, to remove these properties. So again, the land bank has allocated about one and a half million dollars to all of the communities that would be involved. Uh, we are considered one of the larger communities. Um, so there is a separate allocation between large and small communities. Um, they are looking for us to establish a target area. Uh, they would like uh, areas that are previous to other target areas um, that are located in areas of uh, public, uh, public infrastructure investments, or are gonna create new jobs and investment, um, or that are a direct threat to public uh, health. Again, it is a one-to-one -one match. There would be a $5,000 deposit required upon the submission of property uh, for demolition with the balance due upon completion of the demolition. The land bank has indicated to us that uh, Miami Township would be allocated approximately $81,000. Uh, for our total share that we do not have to, if we joined the program, we would not have to utilize all $81,000 of that. That's just what we would be allocated uh, based on our uh, population. They've indicated the average demolition cost is about $15,000. Uh, one of the advantages of the nuisance abatement process, the primary advantage is that the property would not have to be transferred to the land bank and subsequently would not then have to be transferred to the township. So we would not ever have to take ownership of the property. 
Um, it is a little bit of a faster process uh, than the tax foreclosure process, particularly now because of, there's been, as uh, the land bank has indicated, a large delay and backlog in courts uh, due to some of the shutdowns related to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So uh, we can declare this under the, our ORC statutes. We would need the building to be declared in, insecure, unsafe, or structurally defective by either the Miami Valley Fire District, the County Building Department, or the Board of Health. Uh, we have been in touch uh, with the, the Miami Valley Fire District and the Board of Health. Uh, they both offered uh, their cooperation uh, in investigating uh, these potential properties. Again, we feel the fire damage property, which I believe all of you have seen some pictures of that, would certainly qualify. The tax foreclosure process could take uh, care of properties uh, that are tax delinquent, but again, there is an unknown timeline on when those could potentially be demolished. Um, we also don't know until an investigation is done if all of those would really qualify for being demolished uh, versus just the fact that they're, they're tax delinquent. Um, the other major disadvantage though of that is that the township ultimately would potentially have to take ownership of those parcels if the land bank cannot sell those properties to, a, to another individual. Uh, so we do have uh, four potential candidate properties that we are investigating. Uh, 6623 Farmington Road is the uh, fire damaged property uh, that was destroyed and then the adjacent parcel next to it also has some tax delinquency issues um, and, ab and abandonment issues. Uh, the other two properties are also uh, having issues with uh, tax delinquency and uh, abandonment in terms of no utilities. Uh, but in terms of their internal structural soundness, uh, we would need to ultimately gain access to those properties to determine that. But those are the four parcels that we're looking at uh, that may be potentially eligible for demolition. Again, we would have to evaluate as a township uh, whether or not again, we have the resources to provide that local match. Again, our primary emphasis in, in bringing this all to you though, is to remove this fire damaged property, uh, which would, would be a cost to us, 100% cost, if we cannot uh, potentially utilize this program and submit that for eligibility. Uh, we have received some quotes on that. Those quotes range from approximately $5,000 to $17,000. Uh, we would have to vet those uh, contractors further with the land bank to make sure that they were following all the the proper procedures in, in demolishing that. But if we chose to move forward with this program, we would need to establish our, our target areas. Um, we would need to execute the demolition 2.0 program agreement with the land bank and submit that by September 30th of, of this year. Uh, after that, uh, there is a deadline on November 4th to submit the target areas to the land bank. And then November 18th, uh, the land bank would select and approve those target areas and the property list. Once we submit specific properties to the land bank for demolition, then we would also need to provide that $5,000 deposit. So um, with that, um, again, and certainly go over any questions you may have, but uh, that's the quick summary of the program. Um, we do feel that it is an opportunity, particularly in this case of this fire damage property though, to potentially get that removed and be able to uh, reduce our costs uh, to the township on that. So, are there any questions? Yeah, does the nuisance abatement pro process still end up in court? I mean, you had a bullet point on there that it was faster than tax foreclosures. Um, I just don't know if that process allows you to demolish without having, or having a court order enabling you to do so. It's, it's our understanding it does not end up in court, but, it, but again, we do need one of those outside agencies to declare it effectively condemn the property as unsafe and uninhabitable. Okay. Uh, that's why in the case of the fire damage property, we do feel that is relatively evident. Uh, the other properties would need to be investigated by those agencies and they would have to independently determine that it meets that standard um, in order to be torn down. So, and we do have to, again, follow that process um, uh, to make sure that, again, we're, we're certainly not 
removing a structure that otherwise uh, is not warranted. So, thank you. Thank you for sharing that information, Mr. Snyder. So I guess at this time, I'm just looking for an indication of whether the board uh, would like me to continue the process and potentially bring that program agreement forward to you at uh, one of the upcoming meetings, so. I would welcome you bringing it forward, Mr. Posey. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Um, I, I think there's going to be some difference for us in terms of what the target areas are under the criteria the land bank is using. If we have some rural areas that this property isn't really affecting or impacting anything that we would still like to get taken care of. But uh, while the program exists, I think we should submit what's appropriate. Mr. Colt. You're still muted, Don, if you had any thoughts on this one. Sorry about that. I agree we should use them. Excellent. All right, Mr. Snyder, you have everything you need? Yes, thank you. All right, I will make a motion to come out of study session at 750. Second. Aye. I'm not hearing Aaron. I know, I think we you said that is late. Yeah, I'm not hearing Aaron either. He's asking for you, Don. Oh, hey, sorry, Mr. Cole. Can you hear me now? Mr. Posey. Yes. All right. Well, thank everybody. Uh, I think uh, for a virtual meeting, this went off very well. A special thanks to Mr. Hankelman for coordinating all of our speakers and uh, getting them in rather flawlessly. So I will uh, adjourn the meeting at 7.51. Everyone stay safe, stay well.